Good morning, church. This is Pastor Andy. I hope and pray that everybody is doing well. This is our seventh week outside of the sanctuary, and uh, we're continually praising the Lord and worshiping the Lord and and just seeking God through all this, and we're just going to ask that uh, we continue to just seek God through it and see what He has for us. Um, Before I get into our sermon today, I just want to encourage you, um, if you need anything, please let us know. Most of you know my number out there. Uh, please contact me. We'll do anything that we can to help you. Um, hopefully and prayerfully beginning uh, next Sunday, I'll still be doing these types of sermons and putting them on YouTube and, and, and on our website. But hopefully we'll start having a drive-in church here at White Ash. Um, and you'll be able to uh, hear more about that uh, through Facebook and through the prayer chain this coming week. Um, so before we get into today, I'm going to open with a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll jump into our sermon this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you, Lord, for technology and the ability, Lord, to uh, function this way. And God, we just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us and manifest itself before us. And Lord, may your word be richly applied to our lives this week. And we ask it all in Jesus' name, and we all said, Amen. All right, so today's sermon title is Standing on the God's Promises. There's an old song, Standing on the Promises of God. Um, if you know that song, you're probably singing in your head right now. I'm going to spare you from that. Um, but when we begin to look, God's Word is full of promises for His children. It's amazing how many promises that we see from God's Word. Um, I'm going to tell you this later on, but in God's Word, there's somewhere over 3,000 promises of God. Uh, that are listed from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And by other counts, you could go as high as 7,000 promises from our Lord and Savior, and from God Almighty to His people that are in His Word. But one of the things that we're slowly realizing is that uh, for many Christians don't realize that the promises of God are conditional promises. Um, And what happens is a lot of times we get focused on the actual promise and we leave out the conditions. For most people, we focus more on the promises of God, what He can do for us, but we conveniently overlook the conditions of what is required of us. And so when we begin to do that, um, it begins to take away from the promise. And people say, well, how come this promise didn't come to pass? Well, how come this promise didn't come to pass? Well, how come this promise didn't come to pass? And more often than not, The child of God has failed to look at the conditions. You know, we live in a society that wants the gift. Um, Oftentimes, uh, we worship the healing more than we do the healer. Uh, We worship the gift more than we do the giver. Um, And when we begin to do things like that, what it does is it takes our focus off God and it takes our focus on on, on what God can give to us. And as a child of God, we've got to learn that we don't worship the things that we get. We worship God on His throne. We live in a society today that longs to worship the gift more than they do the giver. And what that is is actually idol worship. It's a time where, where you're worshiping an object or a thing more than you are the actual being who created all things. And so today I would just want to look for a few moments at the promises of God in our life and the conditions of those promises. But almost every promise in God's word is conditional. All right? So let's begin to take a look at this. Um, Let's start off with these verses that have been very quoted throughout this pandemic, throughout throughout this crisis. If you're on social media, you'll take no doubt that the verses I'm about to show you have been shared multiple times throughout Uh, this crisis and pandemic, Uh, but as we begin to look at these promises, these verses that have been quoted, I just want to start to point out the conditions that come along with them. The first one is in Psalm 91. It says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save save you from the fowler's snare and from deadly pestilence. Um, That's a wonderful verse to quote. Let's just review it one more time. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from deadly pestilence. Praise God. 
And being that we're in a plague, this verse has been often quoted from Psalm 91, the whole psalm actually in its entirety. Um, And we've started to claim these promises of God. And it's great to claim the promises of God, but actually there's conditions listed in this promise. Let's take a look at them. Um, and let's, let's look at the first condition. Do you all see it? The first condition is he who dwells. In other words, for us to receive this promise to save us from the fowler snare or from deadly pestilence, the Bible says he who dwells. What does it mean to dwell? Dwell means to abide, to remain, to inhabit, to tarry, to occupy. When we begin to occupy our residence in the things of God, when we abide in Him, when we abide by His rules, we start to meet the conditions of this promise. Are you following me? Let's look at the next two conditions. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. There's actually two of them there. The first one is we've got to speak of the Lord. Or his praise has got to be on our lips. We have got to lift him up. Uh, um, not only do we dwell in him, but we also raise him. The Bible says God inhabits the praise of his people. And so we've got to praise him. I will say of the Lord. What are we going to say about him? That he is my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And the last action is that we've got to put trust in him. And so Psalm 91, so while it's often quoted in its glorious psalm, and it's true as all get out, but it's only true to those who dwell, those who inhabit, those who occupy, those who tarry, those who abide in Jesus Christ, and those who will say of the Lord or praise the Lord, and those who put their trust in Him. And so the first promise that we often see quoted during this time, it's a threefold conditional promise that's based on these following conditions, that we dwell, that we say of the Lord, and that we trust in the Lord. Let's look at the next one that's often quoted. It's in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. I've preached this many times in the last seven weeks. When I shut up the heavens that there is no rain or command, uh, locusts to devour the land, send a plague among my people. That's the thing, that's what's going on. We see this plague, all right? God's wanting the attention of his people. And then in verse 14, it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, that's God speaking, and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So let's look at the conditions of this promise. For re- if we want to receive healing and see the, if we want to receive forgiveness and see the healing of our land, it's conditional. What's it conditional on? First, we must humble ourselves. We must humble ourselves. Now, listen, you can quote this verse all you want. You can put it on your social media page. You can put a placard in your front yard. You can write it on your walls. You can take note cards to the front of your car. You can highlight it in your Bible. But this is an action verse. It requires us to humble ourselves, to cry out before God. Then it requires us to pray, to call out to God, tell God who we are, what we're about, ask for forgiveness. And then we see the next thing, that we would seek His face, that we would find out who is the face of God. When you look at somebody's face, you're actually looking into them. You're not looking into what they can give you. You're not looking at the gifts that they give you. You're looking at who the giver actually is. And so not only should we humble ourselves and pray, but that we should seek the face of God. And last, that we should turn from our wicked ways. That we should turn from our wicked ways. And so we actually see four conditions in this, in this verse, in verse 14, that will actually deliver on the promise that God has for His people. Remember the promise that He will hear from heaven and He will forgive our sin and He will heal, heal our land. We have been praying for the healing of our land mightily. Throughout this country, we've heard people calling out, praying, crying out, God, heal our land. And God will if we meet the conditions. Conditions are that we humble ourselves, that we pray, that we seek the face of God, and that we repent, that we turn from our wicked ways. And when we begin to understand that, then the Bible says that God will hear, He will hear it from heaven. Where's God at today? He's in the throne. I will hear it from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and then he will heal our land. Aren't those two great promises that we have that God's given us? He says, man, I will, I will, I will save you from pestilence, from the fowler's snare. 
But in order for me to get that, you've got to dwell in my house in Psalm 91. You've got to dwell with me. You've got to abide with me. You've got to live under my umbrella, he says. Not only do you got to do that, but you've got to call out to him. He says, I will say of the Lord, and you've got to put your trust in the Lord. And then here in 714 of Second Chronicles, he says, man, I want to bring healing to your land. I want to bring forgiveness of your sin. But in order to achieve that, there's a condition The condition is that we humble ourselves, pray, seek His face, and turn from our wicked ways. And we will see the healing of God in our land. And so, throughout God's Word, we see promises after promises after promise. And almost all of them are conditional. Let's look at the biggest promise that God gives us, and we'll see that it too is also conditional. Eternal life in heaven is the greatest promise of God. But even eternal life is conditional. I know what you're saying. Pastor Andy, how is eternal life conditional? Let's check it out. Most quoted verse in all the land is John chapter 3, verse 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. Notice what the condition is, all right? He who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. The condition is that we believe in Jesus Christ, and the promise is that we will not perish, but we will have eternal life. Notice the conditional promises of God. You know, a lot of times in our society, we quote these promises, and then we go on to live however we want to live, and we think that that promise somehow or another encapsulates us. But that's the furthest thing from the truth. The Bible tells us that there's conditions to these. He who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. It doesn't just stop there. In Romans chapter 10 verse 9, it says, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. And so, so far in John chapter 3 verse 16, it says that we've got to believe in Him. In Romans 10 9, it says that we've got to openly declare in Him, believe in Him, And if we do those two things, then we will be saved. You see that these are different verses. The idea is the same. Eternal life is based on a condition that you openly declare and that you believe in Jesus Christ. If you do not openly declare Jesus Christ as your Savior and you do not believe in Him, the Bible says you don't have eternal life. You will not be saved. These are two conditions of receiving eternal life. Let's look at a third one. Acts 2.38, Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we see this again. Each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God, be baptized. Then, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your what? Of your sins then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we see these promises that are listed in God's Word, and every one of them come across with a condition. They are all conditional. Why are they conditional? Because God demands something of His people. God demands something of His people because we are in a place in our society where we worship the gift more than we do the giver. And when we understand, when we seek out who God really is, it demands something of it. It has conditions that come along with it. There are over 3,000 promises from God in Scripture. I've been studying hard this week, and I can only come up with one that is unconditional. And I've tried very hard. Um, I went through the Abrahamic covenant and and through the Levitical covenant, the Davidic covenant, all the way up to the New Covenant. Um, And I've read different commentaries, and I see all types of different things. But in my opinion, and you may have a different one, I see that there's one promise that is unconditional. Are you ready for what it is? It's this, that God loves us. God's love for us is unconditional, meaning there is nothing that we can do to earn it. There's nothing, there's not a certain amount of money that we give. There's not enough good works that we can do. There's, we can't buy it. Our righteousness, the Bible says, is as filthy rags. And so when we begin to understand There is nothing we can do. God's love for us. God loves us. That's a promise in His Word. God loves us. Show me where it's a promise. Verse Romans 5, verse 8. 
It says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Even when we hated him, even when we abhorred him, even when we were disobedient to him, God still loved us while we were still sinners. It had nothing to do with us. We see the love of God is unconditional. People say, well, if that's the case, how come God sends people to hell? But God doesn't send people to hell. The Bible says that hell's created for the devil and his angels. Um, the Jesus, the, in the book of Luke, it says Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. His goal is eternal life for us to save us, all right? But it comes with conditions. And God did everything impossible to make it possible for man to receive eternal life but it demands some call, it demands some conditions of man that we believe, that we confess, that we declare, that we repent, that we call upon God. Romans 5, 8 says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. But it gets, it gets even better. If you're questioning whether the love of God is unconditional or not, we can go onward in Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. And Paul says, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so I'm certain of one thing. There's an unconditional promise that God loves you. And you could say to yourself right now, how in the world can God love me when he knows what I did and said on the yesterday and he'll know what I do and say on tomorrow? Because you were made in his image. You were made in his likeness. You are the crowning glory of the creation of God and he loves his creation. And the Bible tells us that while there's all these promises in God's word, and almost every one of them have conditions, there's one that doesn't. And that is that God loves you. God loves you right now where you're at. He loves who you are. You're his creation. God demands something out of you. He loved you so much that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to come to this earth to die on the cross for your sins that you might have eternal life with him. In order to receive that eternal life, that promise of eternal life, he set some conditions up. Those conditions were that we love God, that we believe in him, that we declare him, that we obey him, that we repent of our sins, and that we openly confess him. Isn't that so great? When we begin to look at the promises of God, God's promises are real and true, but they are really only available in Christ. One of the largest deceptions that we have in our society today is that everybody goes to heaven. That what is right for me may not be right for you. And what that does is it takes away this idea of absolute truth. Either God's word is real or God's word is not real. It can't be both. It can't be negotiated on one page and believed on the next page. It has to be taken collectively in 66 books, 39 in the old and 27 in the new. You have to believe in the inerrancy of God's word. It's not just a reliable history book. It is absolute fact and absolute truth. And one of the problems that we see in our society today is that we want to pull God off a shelf and we want to claim his promises without meeting the conditions. People want to seek out God when they have this time of need. Throughout this pandemic, we've heard cries out to God, but we've seen no changes in lifestyle. We've heard cries out to God. From the very lips of people's mouth, do we see people crying out to God? From the very next word, do we see the cursing of God? We see our politicians in the land. One moment they want to acknowledge God, the next moment they want to acknowledge man. What happens is, is it becomes hypocritical. It doesn't add up. It, 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 never, it, never, it never sums up to anything. And one of the biggest pet peeves in my belief of God, one of the most things that are most aggravating, and one of the most hurtful things that breaks the heart of God is the shallowness, is the nakedness, is the, is the amount of, 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 of hypocrisy that is set forth by the church of Jesus Christ. 
how we praise him one minute and we neglect him the next minute. God's promises have conditions. You cannot claim the promises of God without first meeting the conditions of God. And we live in a society that thinks that they can grab a hold of the promises and fail to meet any of the conditions. And it doesn't work that way. I'll try to put it in better terms. Have you ever tried to uh, maybe qualify for a loan? You can't just go to the bank and say, hey, give me the money. Um, I want $50,000. You go to the bank and say, hey, I want $50,000. You give away $50,000. That's your job as a bank. Give me the $50,000. But the, 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 the bank will tell you, hey, there's conditions in order for you to receive the $50,000. And they'll start doing paperwork. They'll start making things, you have, make sure you have things in order. And when you want to see the promises of God, you're going to have to get some things in order in your life. Now people say, well, Pastor Andy, that's not popular. It doesn't sell. Listen, Jesus Christ did everything he could. He loved you when you were unlovable, when your righteousness was as filthy rags. He came to this earth, bore the weight of the world, the sin upon his body. Why? That you might have life and have it eternally. That you might have life and have it more abundantly. And friends, what happens is you, 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 when, when, we, when we minimize, when we minimize what Christ has done through our disobedience, through our ignorance, through our unwillingness to follow, through our unwillingness to recognize, it cheapens. It tries to cheapen what Christ has done. The promises of God come with conditions. And it is imperative for children of God to realize it. You can't claim the promises of God without first meeting the conditions that he set forth to receive those promises. Let's go on. Is this really true in the Bible? Yeah, the Bible says that we can, follow, we can have God's promises, but we can, we can have them in Christ. You see, when I begin to look through Scripture, I see that almost every promise of God is fulfilled in Christ. And then I came to the verse that actually says it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, it says, For some of God's, whoa, that doesn't say some, doesn't. But it says, For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding what? Yes! With a resounding yes and an amen. And through Christ our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. Let's look at this deeper. Fulfilled in whom? In Christ, our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. If you want to see the promises of God, you will only see them in Christ. In Christ. If, let me rephrase that. If you want to see the conditional promises of God, you will only see them in Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? It means that I believe in Jesus Christ. I have called him my father, my king, my God. I am willing to obey him, to follow his commands. He gave two great commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. That we would uphold his word. That we would abhor evil things such as sexual immorality, jealousy, hatred, envy, malice, greed, anger. That we would have patience. That we would bear forth the fruit of the Spirit. That we in Christ could see all things come to pass. That we could understand the promises of God outside of Christ, no. But in Christ, yes. That we would abide with him forever. That we would be grafted onto the vine. That we would be part of the vine. That we would be part of the branch. That we would understand the goodness of God in Christ. In Christ. You cannot accept or you cannot expect the promises of God when you're living outside of Christ. I don't care what you think. I don't care what somebody else has told you. The Bible says if you want to receive the promises of God, you better get them in Christ because that's the condition. The condition is that you know Jesus Christ, that you're obedient to him, that you follow his will, that you follow his way. I said that in God's word, we see over some 3,000 of God's promises, all of them attached with conditions. We could even go on to more, I think almost up to 7,000. But really, what is the point of this? The point is this. We need to spend more time focusing on the conditions 
then we do the pro- then we do the promise. See what happens as I began this sermon. I told you we focus a lot more on the healing than we do the healer. We focus a lot more on the gift than we do the giver. And when you begin to focus on the create the creation more than you do the creator, it becomes idol worship in our life. See, if you're serving God based on what He can give you, your your relationship probably isn't very good. But if you're serving God because you understand His deep love for you, because you understand His willingness and His call upon your life, because you want to be obedient to Him, these gifts, man, they're so good. I oftentimes, in my sermons, I use my two sons, Caleb and Jack. Caleb's about to be 16 next month. Jack just turned 13. For me and Stephanie, they are the apple of our eye. Um, We love them so much and we thank God for them. We think that they're two of the greatest gifts that God has ever given us. Um, one of the things that we've learned is that, man, when we, when we see our boys do good, man, we just we want to bless them. We, we want to give them stuff. We, we want to just, man, we, we want to do all these things. Um, every month, Caleb and Jack, uh, we, we give them an allowance. Um, um, Caleb, I think he gets uh, almost $30 a month. Jack, I think he gets $15 or $20 a month. It goes up with age. Um, but in order, in order we, we, we promised them that money. We said every month we'll promise you that money. But it's based on these conditions, that you do your chores, that you get good grades in school, and that you're obedient to your mom and dad. And so when they don't do those things, guess what they don't get? They don't get the allowance. Why? Because it's conditional. When we understand that God's promises are not received are, are not received merely by repeating them or posting them on social media, but they're received because of promises of God. Be, when you're obedient to God, when you meet the conditions of God, we understand a lot more about what's wrong with our society, that we need to start meeting the conditions, start focusing on the conditions more than we do the promises. Really, how do we receive God's promises, though? That's, that's, that's a great question. We've got us to this point. God's promises are received by faith. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When we begin to look and we begin to study out, God's promises are received by faith. Faith requires trust in obedience to God and His Word. So let's take that for a second. God's promises are received by faith. Faith requires trust and obedience to God and His Word. So if God's promises are received by faith, faith requires trust and obedience to God and His Word, what does that mean that we should do? That we should have faith. In order to have that faith, It requires trust and obedience to God and His Word. Let's check out some examples. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, the Bible tells us this, It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and received the righteousness that comes by faith. And so... Noah would ultimately receive the promise of God, but in order to fulfill that promise of God, there was a condition that had to be met. He had to be obedient, and he had to trust God. Noah didn't receive the promise until he was obedient and built the ark. Noah didn't receive the promise until he was obedient and built the ark. He had to meet the conditions before he could receive the promise. Let's go on. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and to go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. So first we see Noah. Noah couldn't receive the promise of God until he built the ark. Abraham had to obey and go without knowing where he was going in order to receive the promise of God, to receive the blessings of God. Later on we'll see another picture of Abraham. I don't have it up here But Abraham had to climb a mountain and prepare to sacrifice his son Isaac before God provided the ram. See, his obedience was required in order to receive the promise of God. 
We have to put our faith, we have to have faith, we have to have trust and obedience of God that equals out to our faith in order to see the promises of God. Let's look at another example. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. You remember the story, the Israelites for 40 years, they had traveled across the desert. This is a whole new generation. They stand on the other side of the Jordan. There's Jericho, the promised land that God had told them about. It was a land that flowed with milk and honey. It was a land where the grapes were so big, but it also had giants in the land. But God had promised them years and years ago that that land was theirs. But in order to receive the promise, they had to have faith and they, because their faith required them to be obedient to God and to trust in Him. The obedient point here was they had to go to Jericho and they had to march around the city for seven days. On the seventh day, they had to march around it seven times. And what we see is the Israelites being obedient to God, having trust in Him and His Word, what He's told them to do, and we see their faith lived out before them, and the Israelites received the promise of God. The walls fell down. Let's look at another example. The Bible tells us about this woman named Rahab. She lived in Jericho. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 31 says, It was by faith that Rahab, the prostitute, was not destroyed with the people in the city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And so what happened is, Rahab, the spies come over. They need a place to stay. Rahab hosts them. She doesn't turn them in. And what she does is she has faith in God. She trusts Him and obey Him. And because of her trust and her obedience, we see that Rahab receives the promises of God. Rahab had to help the spies before she could receive the promise of being included with God's people. See, what happens is we see countless examples. We see countless examples of characters and people in God's word who received the conditional promises of God based on their faith. And their faith was equal to trust in God and obedience to God. The point of this is, if you want to see the promises of God in your life, you have to place faith in God. And your faith will equal trust in Him and obedience to Him. Let's look at a few more examples. The Bible goes on in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 32. It says these words, How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the other prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms. They ruled with justice and received what God had promised them. Let's read it again. By faith, by faith, these people overthrew kingdoms ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. How? By faith. By faith. Their faith was equal to trust and obedience in Him. Church, you want to see the promises of God come to pass in your life? We do it by faith, by trust in God, and by obedience in Him. Look what these folks were able to do. They shut the mouth of lions. They quenched the flames of fire. They escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from the death. But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half and others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Yet none of them, none of them received all that God had promised. None of them received all that God had promised. 
How many promises did I say God's word had? At least over 3,000. But yet none of them received all that God had promised. At least not here on this earth. For God had something better in mind. For God had something better in mind for us. So they would not reach perfection without us. If we really want the promises of God in our life, there's three things that we need to do. Number one, we must walk in faith in obedience to God. We must walk in faith in obedience to God. Stop claiming the promises of God and being upset that you don't receive them when you fail to walk in faith and obedience to God. You can't serve the devil and live for Christ. You can't live like a heathen and expect the blessings of God. And I will tell you that the church of Jesus Christ is very bad about this. We want to claim that we live for God on Sunday or when we're in the middle of a pandemic. But any other day, our lips cursing, our eyes wander, we walk in disobedience, and we don't walk by faith. And I'm telling you there's a call coming from the sounds of heaven that God is tired of people pretending to be children of Him. He wants people who will walk by faith, come every day, no matter what they're facing, no matter what it takes. He wants men and women of God to rise up and walk in faith and obedience to Him, to put their trust in Him. When He calls us to do something, that we would do it, that we would speak up for the things of God, that we wouldn't cower, that we wouldn't go away. Church, it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to stop pretending to be the sheep and start being and following the shepherd. And I want you to know that when the shepherd calls and he moves the flock, when the shepherd puts forth a different direction, if the sheep really belong to him, they're going to follow him. If they don't belong to him, they're going to stay where they're at or walk another direction. And it's not okay. It's not okay just to come back into the fold when you're scared. It's not okay just to come back in the fold when you want something or need something. God demands obedience from his children. God demands that we follow him, that we walk in faith. You cannot be a part-time follower of God. And if that's what you are, I encourage you today to stop where you're at, to repent of your sins, to turn from your wicked ways, to declare openly that Jesus Christ is your sovereign God and that you follow him in faith and obedience. Next, we must get rid of the things that hinder us spiritually. We must get rid of the things that hinder us spiritually. The Bible says, I know that we're not perfect here on this earth, I know that we have struggles. I, I know that we fail. I, I fail. You fail. Everybody fails. But Paul said in the book of Romans, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. We must get rid of the things that hinder us spiritually. There is nothing more important in this world than your walk with Jesus Christ. There is nothing more important in this world than walking in faith and obedience to him. Not your job, not your family, not your church, not your pastor, not your hobbies, not your career. The greatest thing that you have to do in this life is to follow Jesus Christ. Now that looks different for everybody, but let me tell you this, it has the same root. And that is that we're obedient to his word, that we bear fruit of the Holy Spirit, and that we walk in obedience and trust in him. And if there is something right here this morning that is hindering you spiritually, you need to get rid of it in your life. If it's your cell phone, get rid of your cell phone. If it's your television, get rid of your television. If, if it's certain friends that you have, get rid of your friends. If, if, it's, if, it's, if it's your job, if you can't honor God through your job, stop going to that job. Find something different. God will provide. You've got to be willing to take a stand to seek out God. And I'm telling you, we've got to get rid of the things that hinders us spiritually, that grow us in Christ. It's not okay to keep absorbing him. Remember what Paul said? We do not continue in sin that grace may abound. God forbid. The child of God should abhor and shun sin. Lastly, maybe the most important, 
we must keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. We must keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. See, in Hebrews chapter 11 that we, we just went through for the parts of it, we see these lists of great heroes of the faith. All of them were able to accomplish great things, great things in this world. They were all able to do extraordinary things. But they weren't able to do it because of their own power. They were able to do it because of what God did it for them in their life. They put their faith, trust, and obedience in God. And every one of the promises that God gave were all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Me and you today, we have the luxury of living on this side of the cross. And praise God that we do. But Jesus Christ, he is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the central root of all humanity. He is supreme in everything. The Bible tells us in the book of Colossians that all things were created by Him and for Him and through Him. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. In Genesis chapter 1, God said, Let us, speaking of Jesus, the Son of Man and the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our own image. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that Jesus Christ was the same yesterday, today, and He will be forevermore. The Bible tells us in Revelation that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He holds the keys to hell and death. He is our everything. The Bible tells us that He's our bright and morning star. Tells us that He's the Rose of Sharon. He's the true vine. He's the door. He's the great shepherd. He is the I am. He is the I was and He is the I will always be. He is all things to everybody at all time, no matter when you lived on this earth or where you've lived at in this galaxy. He is God. In the very end, there will be one still standing, and it will be Him. Jesus Christ has got to be the center of our attention. Because when He's the center of our attention, our faith, our trust, and our obedience is always in Him. I'm going to finish with this verse. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says this. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Who is that huge crowd? We just read Hebrews chapter 11. If you ever come to White Ash, we always use this word. We always ask, if we see a therefore in Scripture, we ask, why is the therefore, therefore, This therefore is there because it comes immediately after Hebrews 11 when they've just read about all these great heroes of the faith. And in Hebrews, the writer in verse chapter 12, verse 1 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge cloud of witnesses to the life of, of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Let us run. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. We just, a few moments ago, we we did this. We must walk in faith and obedience. We must get rid of the things that hinder us spiritually and we must keep our eyes on Jesus. Those aren't Andy's words. Those are God's words. Let's point them out. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Let's strip off anything that hinders you spiritually. Get rid of. Get rid of. Run. Run with endurance the race of God. In other words, walk in faith with obedience and trust in Him. And lastly, keeping our eyes on Jesus. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Friends, today, I hope you've been encouraged. I hope you've been encouraged by how many promises there are in God's Word. And all those promises are yours in Christ Jesus. But woe unto you if you think that you can receive them, if you think you can obtain them just by calling them out, just by repeating them. God demands something in our life. He demands something from you. 
And that's faith and obedience in Him. I love you guys. I hope this word finds you today. I hope you apply it to your life. Because God's got a lot of good stuff for you if you do. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you, God, for this word today. We thank you, Lord, for the promise of it. God, it is so, so good. Help us to focus more on the conditions than we do the promise. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to finish up today with one last thing. In the very bottom part of this verse, we see that Jesus Christ, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith, because of the joy awaiting, the joy awaiting him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Even our Savior, Jesus Christ, went through faith, went through struggle, went through trial, because he knew there was joy coming. And I'm going to tell you, in this life, you will have woes, you will have troubles. But it doesn't compare to the joy. The sufferings on this earth, Romans 8 said, doesn't compare to the joy that God has awaiting us in heaven. The Bible says, I hath not seen and ear hath not heard what God had stored up for his children who love him. And I'm going to tell you, when you walk by faith, obedience, and when you start seeing the promises of God come to pass, Man, it's so good. It's so good. Love you guys. Don't cheapen the promises of God. They're conditional based on us doing something. God bless you. Hope you have a great Sunday. I'll talk to you later.